a great list of people on the screen here tonight. Um, oh, 631. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I am on the East Coast, so right now, right now it is uh, 9.30 at night for me. I apologize for that. You guys are all, on the, most of you are on the West Coast. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. As you can see, we have a, a, list, a great list of people tonight. Uh, Phyllis Graham, Diana uh, Dublay, Dr. Mary Vas uh, Vasudeva, Jonathan Christensen, Elena Smith, and uh, Dana Lima. So... Um, Without further ado, uh, uh, if we could just make sure that everybody has their mics muted. Um, if you do have any questions, you can put it into the chat and we'll try and get to those. And, um, but uh, for right now, if Phyllis from the art, who is the art librarian at Crocker Art Museum, if you would like to start Phyllis, thank you. Thank you, can everyone hear me? I see the slide. Maybe a little louder. Can you turn it up a little bit, Phyllis? Okay, this is as loud as it goes. I'll, I'll speak okay. as loudly as I can. Yeah, that should okay. work. So hi, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to your program on special libraries. I've held the part-time position of librarian at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento for a little over three years. Just briefly, the collection is nearly all print and consists of around 13,500 shelved items, artist files, institutional archives, and two extensive private archives on California art donated to the museum. One was recently added to the Online Archive of California, our first edition. The finding aid was prepared by intern Priscilla Amanero from your master's program. So we're open to the public two days a week, um, and I'm here those, those two days, or by appointment. The position requires sufficient cataloging skills to search, edit, and download MARC records, um, and to create new records for materials not yet added to OCLC, but things potentially significant for the art and museum community. For these tasks, I make daily use of the OCLC connection client together with our in-house ILS software. The OCLC online training modules have helped improve my knowledge of cataloging. And I always benefit from looking at how other museum or academic libraries have classified different types of art literature. So we have JSTOR, Oxford Art Online, and Ask Art available to staff and docents through library subscriptions. And I have a small and very dedicated team of volunteers who help with the physical processing labeling, reshelving, etc. And when we have backlogs, I pitch in with those tasks as well. My predecessor was also part-time, and through much of the museum's history, there hasn't been a staff librarian. So when I started in early 2015, only about half of the library's holdings were represented in the electronic catalog. I'm sorry, are you hearing me? Okay, um, so it was essential to add some 6,000 records as quickly as possible. As of last year, the database is finally up to date and linked to the museum website. Since the public hours are limited, I receive most of my reference questions via email or phone, and these are from researchers as far away as Spain and Germany. The questions are you about a specific artist or work in the collection or about the historic property that we occupy? Um, we have the resources to answer most questions directed to the library, but occasionally it's more appropriate to refer queries to the curatorial or the registration departments. So many visitors from the Sacramento area and elsewhere want to know about the Crocker family, that is the founders, their residence and the gallery and ballroom they had built in the late 1860s to showcase their new art collection. I'm the most accessible staff member for these questions and most of them come from the casual walk-in visitor. Although we don't have a significant acquisitions budget, I keep an eye on art bibliographies 
and add new publications um, and occasional new titles related to the museum's holdings. This would be mainly in American and California art and old master drawings. The uh, core part the donor's original collection. I also respond to requests from museum staff to acquire specific new or old imprints. And then based on our upcoming exhibition schedules, it's important to fill in gaps, um, publication gaps that will support the curators, the educators, and the docents in their mission to inform the visiting public. Otherwise, for continued growth, we really depend on selective acceptance of donations. And we've had very significant gifts from practicing artists, from artists' estates, from collectors, and from professional art historians. It is very helpful, if not required, in most special libraries to demonstrate some background or knowledge in the subject matter of the particular collection. So nearly all the art museum librarians I've met through work and professional organizations have also had a graduate degree in art history. So I have an MA and PhDs are not all that uncommon these days. Um, internships are of course a really good way to get a foot in the door. It's a very, very competitive field as museum jobs are in general. I would say for aspiring um, museum or academic librarians in the art field, um, affiliation with ARLIS, the Art Librarian Society of North America, is really important. They're such an active and collaborative organization and really supportive of new people in the field. Of course, larger museums often have full-time library staff with dedicated catalogers and archivists and dig digital experts, along with the front desk librarians. But I know there are many, many one-person shops in the art museum world. So it does require a diverse basket of skills in reference and acquisitions and cataloging, along with some institutional and subject knowledge to do the job effectively. So briefly, that's a general background. And I would be happy to answer any questions specifically about the Crocker Library collection, my position, uh, I've also worked in two other special libraries, a botanical and a classics and archaeology library. So if anyone is curious about other, other environments. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, does anybody have any questions specifically for Phyllis? Phyllis, I just wondered if you had to have um, a, much of a research background. It sounds like some of the questions you get from the patrons would require research. It does require research. And, um, you know, you can always uh, respond to people that you will, uh, you will get back to them. And over time, you'll become more familiar, of course, with the collection there were a lot of things especially in the archives i mentioned that i was very unfamiliar with when i started although i had a pretty solid background in art history and i had worked at the museum on um, art research as a graduate student but you know it's it's just the process of becoming familiar with your materials and and people are very very patient as long as you um, indicate that you're I'm going to make an effort and, and get back to them. I will say also, uh, that I have had the advice from uh, from curators that um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't write their term papers for them. So when, when people do call or email me, um, I, I, I provide um, the basic information, but I, I don't write the paper for them. Phyllis, we do have a question from somebody. Um, it says, can you elaborate on the Botanical Library? Did you have a background in botany at all? 
No, I did not. And uh, this was a position I held when I was in library school at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. It was a part-time position, um, student position at the Dumbarton Oaks um, Research Library, which has a botanical, a Byzantine, and a Colombian component. So I was assigned to the garden library and did some reference and did a little copy cataloging and uh, only briefly, only for a few months. So you said there, you worked with the garden area. So was that actually real plants that you worked with then? No, it's a reference collection on basically uh, the history of, um, of botanical um, science and botanical art and everything to do with um, with with that with that subject matter. Uh, every year there are fellows that come from institutions around the world who work in the fields of landscape history. Um, so it, it's not just botanical; it's it's landscape and landscape architecture. But the uh, the initial core of the library was uh, as a as a botanical as a collection of books on, on the botanical science and art. That sounds, uh, oh, somebody is asking, was it the Barton Oaks Research Library? Oh no, it was, it's the Dumbarton Oaks Research Library in Washington, DC. Okay. Right. Okay, sounds like somebody is familiar with it. <laughs> All right, it sounds, in, sounds fascinating. Um, now, you said you had a, an MA in art history, is that right? That's right. All right. All right, Phyllis, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight and giving us all this information. Um, I know we really appreciate your time that you've given to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck to all of you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead. Thank you. We'll go ahead with our next participant tonight. Uh, we have um, Diana Dublay, who is a music librarian for Symphony Nova Scotia. Hello. I'm just trying to share my screen. Let me know if it actually works. Yep, it looks like you're there good to go. go. Okay, excellent. Hi everyone, my name's Diana and I'm gonna be giving you a quick introduction to orchestra libraries, which um, they're sort of a smaller subset of what we call performance libraries, which are libraries that serve performing ensembles like orchestras and ballets and operas and wind ensembles and things like that. So I'm just, I'm in the orchestra, so I will talk about it from that perspective. So here's a little bit about me. I have a Bachelor of Music from the University of Victoria in Victoria, BC, Canada, and an MLIS from Dalhousie University in Halifax, which is where I'm based now. And most of my previous experience was from academic libraries and archives. So this was fairly new to me when I started. And a little bit about my organization. Symphony Nova Scotia is the only professional orchestra in Atlantic Canada. And we have 37 full-time musicians, which actually makes us a pretty small orchestra. We're considered a chamber orchestra, but we regularly hire more for bigger shows. And we have a 33-week regular season that has over 40 unique programs in it, plus two weeks in the summer season, which we do about three to four unique programs. So every single one of those programs has different music on it, which is my responsibility to procure. So to summarize the roles and responsibilities of a orchestra librarian in a very oversimplified terms, the orchestra librarian is responsible for all aspects of music preparation. So basically anything to do with the music that we're performing is my job in some way. 
as you can imagine, this is a fairly large job. So bigger orchestras usually have more than one librarian. Because we're such a small orchestra, it all falls to me. And if you'd like to know more about this, I highly recommend that you see um, the um, MOLA's Performance Library and a Career Introduction. MOLA is the major orchestra librarian association, and they have a ton of really good information. I'm just trying to figure out how I can access the chat. Here it is, and I will post the link to that there so you can look at it. Um, this is my first time using Zoom, so I apologize. There we go. All right, so the main points here are the first thing you need to do is get the music. So that can mean buying music if it's in, out of copyright and you can purchase it. It means renting music if it's still under copyright and someone owns the rights to the sheet music. It means making parts if someone has commissioned the work or we're doing a new arrangement and the composer or arranger hasn't made any parts before and they send them to me and I print them all and I print about 4,500 parts a season, which turns into a lot of folding, as you can imagine. Once I have the music, or find the music, then I have to prepare the music. The biggest part of this, which no one tells you about before you start this job, is you have to get the bowings. So if you ever see an orchestra, and you notice that all the string players are playing together and all their bows go in the same direction, unfortunately that does not happen organically. So all those bowings are marked into the parts. So I have to get the parts to the principals or the heads of the section, they mark their parts, and then I have to get, either I have to copy it into all the other parts or I have to get someone else to copy it for me. So that takes up a lot of my time. I also have to do things like talk to com conductors and make sure that we're using the addition that they want, or if there are any cuts, I have to make sure that those are in there so the musicians know what we're playing. We also, because we're such a small orchestra, I deal with reductions a lot. So we'll get a piece in and it'll have 32 wind parts and we have 13 wind players. So I have to go to the conductor and say, which of these parts do you really want covered? So that's also when it is part of that. And then like most of that is just communicating with people. So conductors and guest artists and arrangers and rental companies, and they may not necessarily communicate back. So there's a lot of emailing there too. And just to make this extra complicated, our collective agreement with the orchestra or the musicians union states that all music must be out two weeks before the first rehearsal. So you can imagine it involves a lot of working really, really far in advance. So I usually start, I'll order music at the beginning of the season if I can. And then six weeks before I'll start bowing, it usually takes about three weeks to get the Boeings done, and if there's anything else complicated in there, I have to start even sooner. So it's a lot of working on a different timeline for a lot of different things. And then finally, I also have to report stuff about the music. So anything that requires information about the music that we're playing also comes to me. So I provide information for the program sheets. I go out in the programs for the audience. I also make the budget for the library, so I figure out how much everything's going to cost and what we have to pay to do what. And then I also report for licensing. So SOCAN is the um, Canadian Performing License Association. So anything, like whenever we perform something that's under copyright, we have to pay them so that the copyright owner gets money for us performing it. And then if we're doing other arranging or we need a copyright license for that, then that's also my job. So you learn a lot about copyright very quickly. Um, there we go, oh, sorry, wrong button. Assuming that hasn't all scared you off and you're still interested in orchestra librarianship, most orchestra librarians do start as musicians. As you can imagine, reading and writing music is a really, really integral part of the job. I have heard of someone who did the job without being able to read music, and I have no idea how he did it, but it definitely helps if you can. You also, just understanding the needs of an orchestra musician is really important. I play the oboe, so I play in orchestra, so I know like what 
a bad page turn looks like and I know like how big the music has to be in order to read it from a stand. So just little things like that. Um, for actually getting here, there aren't really any like, you can certainly tailor your program to give you some music library experience, but it's really hard to get like just from an academic program. So the best way to get the experience is to do the job. So there are music festivals that will hire intern librarians. You can also do, like if your university has an ensemble and a music program, you can volunteer with them. There's just volunteering in general. That's how I got into it. I cold emailed the librarian at the time when I started and asked if I could volunteer and he said yes. And so that's how I got in with SNS. And then again, MOLA is just a really, really good resource because they post all their internships and they'll post jobs and they're just really, really great people that will really support you. And when you actually find a position, you act like all other orchestra musicians, you have to audition as well. They call them library and auditions. So there's usually a written exam. I was lucky and got to use Google for mine, but they usually don't let you. So you have to memorize what publishers cover, what pieces, what your copyright law is and the company country you're working in things like that. And then they'll often do skill testing too. So they'll test like, you know, your taping skills and your bowing skills and things like that. So it's quite arduous. And you can imagine the bigger the orchestra, the more intense they'll test you. I did not get tested that intensely or I would not have gotten the job. But that's pretty much it. In conclusion, you have to be very organized with a good memory for detail, be able to keep track of lots of different things at the same time, and be willing to work long hours and late nights. But you also get to work with lots of cool artists and be intimately involved with the orchestra in a way even musicians aren't, which is pretty cool. So that's it for me. Does anyone have any questions? Diana, this is Amy. Um, I'm a, a choir singer and I am also a member of the Music uh, Library Association. I didn't know if they would have any assistance for people who are trying to get into music librarianship, for instance. Yeah, for sure. Um, MOLA was actually started by someone who was originally part of MLA and you know, MLA is very academic music librarian focused, which is great if that's what you're interested in. But or like performance librarianship is such a different skill set that MOLA kind of branched off from that. So it depends what part you're interested in. If you'd really like to do academic librarianship, then MLA is certainly a good resource for that. Thank you. I didn't realize there was that that much of a difference, but I appreciate that. Yeah, there's definitely, it's more having, being a working orchestra, like library. So, you know, like an academic library, people will come in and they'll check out things, but it's not like your library is constantly in rotation. Whereas with the orchestra, the music is being used all the time and you're, you're sort of serving a very different um, audience. I see in the chat there, someone asked if I attend all the orchestra's concerts. Yes, one of my duties is I have to collect all the music at the end of the show. So I have to be there. If we're doing like multiple repeats of a show, I'll usually be there for the first concert just to make sure nothing horrible goes wrong. And then assuming that everything, one's got everything under control, I'll come for the end of the last show and pick up all the music. All right, that is fascinating, Diana. There's a lot of people, well, you're seeing the chat, a lot of people are really finding what you, uh, your work really interesting. Um, thank you so much for, for your time tonight and giving us all that information. Um, let's see, it looks like our next speaker tonight is our very own uh, Mary Vasudeva. I'm gonna go ahead, Mary, thank you. Okay, is it working? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm an intern, so my experience is gonna be a little different um, than the rest of you guys who are doing these as your job, but um, still 
very different, I think, from a standard library. I'm also the programming director, and I put my email there just in case anyone had any questions. So I'm working at HP Labs um, down in Palo Alto, and this is kind of what I'm going to talk about, the, a little bit about the library, uh, what was the process of getting the internship, what does it entail, and how did I prepare for it. So the library, <laughs> uh, when I interviewed, I was told there is no library there. So it's all online, and so we don't have any physical um, contents and HP used to have the largest technical library in the United States and they have digitized the entire thing. Um, it has two major online libraries and one is public and one is internal. So you guys can go to the HP lab public library and online and everyone else at HP has access to the internal library. And both libraries focus on everything from patents to publications that are generally in-house created, and we also offer database access. And I put up a um, link to one of the databases because it's so different than the databases I w am used to seeing. I'm gonna see if I can click on this so you can see it. Um, so, okay, is it opening up? So this is the database that um, we use. So you can just see from the title, For Forging a Stronger Blockchain Mary, with Identity. You'll, I'm sorry, you'll have to actually change your screen share to the browser window, otherwise um, we can't see it. Okay. Perfect, thank okay. you. So you can kind of see this is a little, the topics here are a little bit different than what we might expect in um, a standard library. Okay, now I have to figure out how to get back to the other screen. <laughs> okay, so that has been quite an education for me. Um, and we also, our library offers database training to our, to our um, employees all over the world, so, and, and HP has employees in almost every country you can think of. And the internal library also includes correspondence, research, people's notebooks that have been digitized, videos, pictures, et cetera. So it's a really comprehensive collection. So how did I get the internship? And these were the things that I thought kind of were key and building that resume, doing what I didn't know, um, so I said kind of filling the holes and I have a PhD in English So for me to go into a technical lab was a huge difference and But I did all kinds of stuff and Diana said volunteer So I did a lot of volunteering and I think that helped me get the internship and then another thing that I thought was really useful was being aware of the skills that I was developing and doing the ePortfolio process was super helpful for that because it made me reflect on all the skills I actually have, even if I didn't think I had them. So I recommend or highly recommend that as you do each course, you try to think, okay, what skills am I building? And how can I sell those skills in an internship or in volunteering? Because sometimes it doesn't seem obvious what those skills are. So the, my job is content management. And as I said, almost all of it's online. And so what I do is I enter metadata, but it's very different metadata. Um, some of the terms are like metallurgic process. Um, there's no Dublin core or any of that because the idea at the business is that these um, users need to be familiar with the metadata. So that's why we use terms like metallurgic process. And today I was generating keywords for a research article, and it was on stegotone detection. Um, and I had never even heard of that before. So that was, um, this whole experience has been incredibly eye-opening for me. And another thing we've been doing is migrating data from one database to another, from DSpace to SharePoint. So having familiarity with some of those databases is really helpful too. And then other tasks, I recently attended a talk on procurement and 3D printing. I've researched bibliometric tools, uh, created PowerPoints. So thank any of your instructors that um, want you to do PowerPoints. I have to do an executive summary tomorrow. I've written a newsletter. I've created abstracts for technology articles. And I've also 
created blog posts. So it's a lot of different um, activities. And these were the classes and experiences that I found useful, metadata, um, but not the Dublin Core stuff, just the idea of metadata and how it's organized. I also did a volunteer internship within the stacks doing metadata, and I think that was one of the key reasons I got the internship, because she said most students have no experience with actual metadata, so that was really important. Uh, the HTML CSS class, 240, was really helpful. Be doing this, being the programming director, um, UX, doing user experience, that's been key throughout the whole internship, knowing the lingo, and um, I was also a Wikipedia intern doing a lot of research, and that really helped as well, because I have to do a lot of research here as well, even on things I don't know anything about. So my key takeaways are librarians have got to communicate, whether that's through metadata or building a resume, and so it's so good to build those written and oral communication skills, and adapt your skills, take risks, do what is unfamiliar, and businesses do not necessarily have any more money. <laughs> I thought because we were going to HP, they could have whatever they wanted. Not true. So we're always hunting for open source and um, free stuff we can use. So you really have to learn to prioritize. So that's my um, internship in a nutshell. Any questions? Mary, it looks like there's a question in the chat box. Um, the question is, what skills do you see as most important in your job? Well, um, again, the, the research and being able to research things I don't know anything about. So being able to, and Wikipedia was very helpful to that, so I can go to Wikipedia to look stuff up. Um, and the metadata, do a ton of metadata creation. Uh, so that was really important and, and again just having a broad range of tools to draw from and not having just one skill set and then I also see did you relocate at all so um, I did not relocate and this is not really a virtual internship so originally I was supposed to go to Palo Alto and do this but when we interviewed <laughs> I told him I wouldn't do that because the drive is an utter nightmare I live in the Bay Area but um, it's just horrible. So we agreed that I would only come down there about once every three weeks. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I think that was just an open mic. I don't think oh, that was an okay. question. Okay, and I should stop so that I don't take over too much of your time, Jonathan, sorry. <laughs> You're fine, not a problem at all. All right, thank you, Mary. Uh, and like you said, yep, Jonathan is next. So if you want to go ahead and take over, Jonathan. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So my name is Jonathan Christensen, uh, and Today I'm going to be talking about what I do at the NASA and Caltech Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in uh, Pasadena, California. So uh, one of the things I, I like to point out is that um, this is a NASA facility. Um, it is an actual laboratory. Um, and I do not have a science background. My bachelor's degree was in history with a minor in anthropology. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting because a lot of people think that you, to, in order to work in a STEM library, you need to have a STEM background, um, and that's actually not the case. Um, and I've talked to many librarians and other people at STEM libraries that hire other librarians, and they say having a STEM background um, isn't necessarily a qualifying factor. So it, it doesn't hurt if you do, um, but it also doesn't necessarily mean you have to. So a little bit about JPL. Um, so it was founded in um, October 31st of 1936 uh, when JPL launched the first ever rocket. Um, that's actually where rockets were um, originally built and designed. Um, and 
as, as you can see from the title, it, it is a NASA facility. Um, as such, it's a federally funded research and development center. So it's actually um, managed by the California Institute of Technology, which is a private university, um, but it's primarily funded by NASA. Um, one of the interesting things to note is that the founding date is October 31st of 1936. Being that they founded rocketry, they also spent, uh, sent the first ever satellite into space. So what that means is that uh, JPL actually predates NASA. It's the second oldest of NASA's 10 um, centers, but it is um, only one of three that actually predate NASA. It originally started, um, when it was originally taken in, it was part of NACA, um, which was the organization for uh, aeronautics before NASA. Um, as such, NASA is, uh, or I'm sorry, JPL is NASA's facility for the robotic exploration and scientific study of the solar system and beyond. Um, a good portion of their research um, is about Earth sciences, setting up uh, satellites to study global weather patterns, um, climate change, things like that. But also they are um, not just our country, but the world's leading um, exploratory center for uh, the solar system. So they're the ones who run the Mars rovers and the Mars landers, um, one of which is uh, scheduled to launch uh, Saturday morning. Um, so if you want to get up at four o'clock in the morning, you can watch that launch. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's a very interesting place to work. Um, what a lot of people wouldn't really think is that it has its own library archives and records section. Um, the library is an actual physical library. They have um, an online and a physical presence on lab. They serve most of the uh, needs of the lab, whether it's the business side of things or the engineering and science, but most of it does lean towards engineering and science. Um, uh, however, we have 3D printers for patrons, which are our, our users and other, our engineers and staff, to come in and just play with 3D printers and things like that. Uh, it's a really big deal because um, one of our next missions is actually going to have 100 uh, 3D printed parts on it, which is pretty interesting. So what do I actually do at JPL? Why, why is there a librarian or whatever? So. Um, it all started last May um, with an internship that I got actually through SLA Southern California chapter. Um, and over time that internship evolved into a part-time uh, academic position. And then ultimately last November turned into a full-time position. Uh, I'm, I'm a records management specialist. So I work very closely with the library and the archives, but from the records perspective. I do a lot of work with records life cycle and um, accessioning items into the archives. But we also do things, so for instance, it, it's still very similar to a librarian position because we have users who will come in looking for, for journal articles or books or things on many of the things, uh, the engineering or science uh, projects that they're working on. However, being what JPL is, a lot of times they're doing things that have never been done before um, or have only been done by JPL. So um, oftentimes the records job becomes a librarian job because we have to go through and search for items that uh, no one else in the world has um, as far as engineering and, and science documents. So it's very interesting um, work to be able to, to do. I'm sorry, give me just one moment. I'm sorry, just one moment. I have a little bit of a sound issue going on. All right, sorry about that. Um, so, um, okay, sorry. So, the, so I do a lot of records life cycles and, 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 a session, and archival accessioning. Um, I manage documents and uh, drawing preservation. So all of the original engineering drawings that we have 
that the engineers have been designing for over the last uh, 82 years, um, we're responsible for protecting those and maintaining those. Uh, they don't actually go into the archives because they technically could be used again. They haven't finished their, their original life cycle. So um, they remain records. Um, I do a lot of digitization. I'm responsible for destruction and disposition. Uh, I get to work on electronic records management, digital assets management systems, uh, knowledge capture and knowledge management. Um, so there's a lot of very interesting things that I get to do. One of the nice things about working for an organization like JPL is you have to wear a lot of hats to do a lot of things. So I kind of get to have my hands in the library. I've, I've worked in circulation there. Um, I've done uh, uh, processing in the archives, and then I do my regular everyday work uh, in the records group. Uh, let's see here. So I'll take some questions. I did see a couple that were coming through. So Sarah asks, is the launch going to be live on YouTube? It should be live on YouTube, but it's also going to be on NASA's main website. And I think it's going to be live on their YouTube site as well. Um, if you're on the West Coast and it's a clear morning, which it looks like the weather forecast shows it's supposed to be very clear here. Um, you can pretty much see it as far south as San Diego. It's going to be launching from Vandenberg, uh, which is up closer to the Bay Area. So basically everybody on the West Coast should be able to see it. So if you're willing to get up super early, um, it's going to be a fun, fun morning. Um, it's actually a mission I've gotten to work on myself. I do most of the document uh, preservation for it. So um, it's going to be very cool. I'm very excited for it. Amy, you're asking about digitization. So digitization, it depends on what it is. I physically have a you know bulk scanner that I can sit there and scan documents myself. Um, we have a reproduction center as well um, that can do large scale um, scanning and digitization. Um, and various other facilities. We've got a media library that's separate that takes care of um, most of the video and audio type stuff. So there's a lot of different things and I kind of have to work with everybody to get it all to get it all done. Um, most of the documents that I work with are technical manuals and engineering drawings, um, which can be really cool because I've actually seen some of the hand-drawn um, uh, engineering blueprints for missions that people know of, like the Mars rovers and things like that. Um, and then feel free to just stop me when we're going um, over on time, but I'm just going to keep answering questions until I'm told to stop. Uh, so, Mayra, I see that what skills were you able to transfer? Um, yes. Actually, Jonathan, yeah, let, since we are okay. a little over, let's go ahead and stop now, but we'll hold these um, until, the, until the end. Sure. If people want to stick around, they can do that. All right, all right. Thank you, Jonathan. Not I know a lot problem. Of people are really interested in in your work at NASA. Um, let's see. Next, we have uh, Elena Smith from the California State Library. Thank you, Elena. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Elena Smith. I'm a reference librarian at the State Library. Um, I do not have a slideshow for you guys today because I am a talker, and if I have a slideshow, that will just encourage me to talk more. Um, so, uh, are you not hearing me? Nope, we can hear you just fine. You're good. Okay. All right. I just saw the notes like, wait a minute. What? Okay. So, um, as I was mentioned, I work at the State Library. Most of you are probably familiar with the public's, um, with the State Library funding. Um, endeavors for public libraries. I work on the public service side of the State Library. We have six public service sections at the library. There's the Information Services section, gen Government Publications, the Whitkin Law Library, Sutro Library, um, the Braille and Talking Book Library, and then my section, the California History section. Within that section, um, within the California History section, we have four floors worth of material. We have materials going back to Father Sarah. Actually, we have materials going back to ancient Egypt. Please, nobody tell the Egyptians. Um, 
We are a combination library and archive. So we have obviously unpublished materials. We also have a fair number of published materials. As for how I got to be able to work at the library doing this job, I started out like everybody else. I started as a student assistant um, at the Sac State, um, Sac State's library. And I worked my way up. I worked as a student assistant while I was going to college and in grad school. Um, I got a, a master's in public history as well as one in library science. I took a couple of internships. And then I was lucky enough to be able to work at Yolo County Library as an extra help librarian or extra help library assistant. That parlayed into working in Nevada County as a um, library technician. And I had submitted an application while I was job hunting and all of a sudden the state called and you don't turn down the state when they say they want to interview you. So I went and interviewed with them and I just got very lucky. As far as what I do, um, my, I am a reference librarian. So my day consists of, as a start, I check interlibrary loans. We lend out to libraries throughout the nations and I'm in charge of that for my section. So I'll go ahead and process those. My next step will be answering reference questions. We receive reference questions um, via email and those will be international. I will also man the reference desk for about two hours each day. We have about six librarians in my section, so we cycle through who mans the desk. And I'll answer phone reference and in-person reference when I'm on the desk. In addition to that, I have a number of other things that I do. One of the things that I do a lot of is actually constructing research guides. Those are actually a great kind of outreach tool because you can send them to state government and say, see, we have stuff that you might be interested in. You should totally come and check us out. I do a lot of writing for the web. Um, I also do computer programming for digitization projects and other special projects that, within my section. Um, archival processing. I'm the, I'm the postcards queen at the library. If you have any questions about postcards, don't ask. Um, I do a lot of indexing. Um, that would be basically cataloging of um, subjects within periodical articles or things of that nature or ephemera. Um, outreach of various sorts. So I'll go out and I'll do talks. I will I'm in charge of creating recognition programs for historical societies and libraries. I also train a fair number of volunteers. As far as the things that I have learned that I have needed um, from the LIST program, reference is huge. Um, being able to do a successful reference interview is really important in my job. Also being able to straddle between the 19th century and the 21st century technology wise. Like many of the older libraries, I related well to Phyllis when she was talking about the majority of her collection being undigitized. Um, most of our access points are undigitized. So it's a ver very much a matter of, yes, I'm going to do some high powered computer searches. And then I'm going to go to the local card file and check there, too, just to see if there's something in there. And oftentimes there is. Collection knowledge, similarly, is a really big deal. Um, it takes about six months to learn just the access points to the materials within the California History Collection. That's not talking about the materials. That's literally just the indexes. Um, so that is really an important part of the job. Um, technology, I basically got hired because I have a minor in computer science. Um, that really helped um, as far as getting both into this job and in another job. Um, management skills. I do manage volunteers. I've been managing volunteers since I was a library technician. Um, volunteers and interns. So being able to manage people, that is very helpful. Um, writing and speaking abilities. I do a lot of web writing and a lot of speaking. So very much that's a big part of it. Teaching abilities. Most of my presentations last an hour plus because I'm basically doing a training session on how to do research. So being able to lay it out in a manner that people will find 
coherent and useful is important. And finally, cataloging. Indexing is basically cataloging, just cataloging light. So assigning subject headings and doing description. What I tend to tell my interns and volunteers um, who are looking at getting into the field is don't be afraid to take the SCUT jobs. They build on each other. Um, you may start out as a student assistant, but that's not where you'll end up if you're willing to jump on the opportunities as they come. Another thing that I tell them um, is do what you can to make your resume stand out. If you have a foreign language or if you have the opportunity to learn a foreign language, take advantage of it. Same thing with um, the technology side. Are we still good? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. All right. Being able to program is huge. Um, and that kind of sums up my advice. Keep a sense of humor. Patrons are pretty funny. They ask some pretty funny questions. Does anybody have any questions for me? Elena, this is Amy. Do you, how closely do you work with archivists in your job as a research librarian? Next door, <laughs> if that. Um, I, I'm going into the stacks all the time, um, and I'm talking with the main processing staff about the collections that they're processing. For us, there is no real division. We all do a little bit of processing. Um, it just depends on our job classification, the proportion that we do. Chal challenges that I face in my role um, is, like I said, keeping a sense of humor. The questions really get funny. Um, sometimes navigating bureaucracy can be a bit of a challenge. But really one of the biggest challenges is just getting the word out. We are a very well kept secret. So oftentimes just getting to the patrons is half of the battle. Okay, if anybody has any further questions, I'm putting in my email, okay? All right, thank you very much, Elena. Um, Next up, we have our final speaker of the night, uh, Dana Lima, who um, works with the King Library Special Collections. Hey, everybody. This is Dana. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Well, I just got done with my other job and dashed home, so I'm hoping everything is working and connecting. Um, does someone have access to the slides I sent that they can put up? If not, I can wing it, that's fine. Nope, I can do that, just one second. Thank you, no problem. Ah, oh, perfect, thank you. Okay, so as I said, my name is Dana and I'm a student assistant uh, for the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Library Special Collections and Archives. I've been a, special, a student assistant for them for about a year, it'll be a year in June, so I've done it for several semesters. And the archive, the special collection archive, is primarily a historical account of San Jose State University and local San Jose, a little bit of local history of San Jose, Santa Clara County, and some amount of state of California history, especially in relation to politics and political movements and different things that have happened. So let's see, I'm not quite sure how to get to the next slide. There we go, thank you. So uh, I don't know if any of you have been to the King Library, but it is located on the fifth floor of the King Library. And uh, we're housed in a little suite. We're there with the Beethoven Center and the Steinbeck Center and also the California room of the San Jose Public Library. We have over 225 individual collections. And by that I mean, for example, I'm working currently on a very large collection of documents and photographs and ephemera that 
are were donated to us by Norman Minetta, who was a U.S. Congressperson representing California, also was the U.S. Department of Commerce Secretary and U.S. Transportation Secretary, and was in a, a local, he was also mayor of San Jose, and was also local and in state government for a very long time. So his, his collection of items is what we call one collection. So there are over 225 individual collections housed at the King Library Special Collections. We have, as I mentioned, things like documents, ephemera, which includes things like plaques, trophies, portraits. Uh, we even have silver tea sets, bobblehead dolls, <laughs> those kinds of things, as well as a collection of books. Uh, many, we have a large collection of books written by professors and instructor, instructors of San Jose State University. We have theses. We have quite a lot of different things that are available. Plus we have photos, photos, negatives, um, anything associated with photography in any format, videotapes, cassette tapes, oral histories on cassette, all kinds of things. So it's just kind of everything you could possibly imagine that falls within our scope of chronicling the history of the university and the local area. We keep our finding aids on the online archive of California and I did the, the link there is clickable. It's also called the OAC and that is a very large finding aid which brings together most of the archival um, information and finding aids from the UC system plus mm -hmm. a lot of other archives that are available all across the state. So say for example if you're looking for information on um, the internment camp, the Japanese, you know, Japanese internment, you can type that into the online archive of California and it will show you all of the institutions that have information, uh, where it is, what it is, all the metadata about that information and how you can access it. Uh, as part of my job, let's go with who's staffing. Right now we're staffed by an archivist and she is responsible for training individuals like me, the student assistants, and how to assess and inventory and preserve, organize, categorize, and then create the metadata and digital records for the items that we receive for our collections. We have a digital asset manager who's in charge of if there are requests for items to be scanned and digitized. Not a lot of our materials are digitized. They're mostly in physical form. And she's also in char charge of making sure the MARC records and the OAC records are all up to date and match because what you find in the MARC record for the library should look a lot like what you find on the finding aid for the OAC. We also have, of course, a department head. Uh, who's newly started. His name is Craig. He started in November. And then there are about six to eight student assistants who do the processing, the create the MARC records, create the finding aid information. And, and also we assist researchers who come into the reading room. These may be San Jose State students working on thesis or working on assignments from one of their instructors. We've had genealogists, we've had newspaper reporters, people who are interested in certain aspects of history in the San Jose or Santa Clara area, all kinds of people who come in and use the research and research and access these uh, primary source documents in the reading room. I did want to mention, we are, because several of us are graduating, I just finished my last assignment of my last class to finish my degree, but there are several of us who are going to be graduating this May, and so they are actually hiring student assistants. So if you are in the San Jose area or can get to the King Library and work between 12 to 20 hours per week, uh, please contact Diane Malmstrom. Her email is there. They want people who are either MLIS or MARA students and people who can commit to at least a couple semesters worth because there's a lot of training and they want you to be around for a while after they invest that training in you for you. Uh, let's see, some of the things I wanted to mention about working there was it, for those of you who are looking forward to doing your ePortfolio, uh, it did provide me with a lot of evidence for my ePort. Keep in mind, it, not all of your evidence has to come from your classwork, it can come from work too. I was able to produce 
plenty of evidence for anything related to cataloging, for collections management, and uh, I'm trying to think, there's one other for the e-port, but anyway, this particular job position provided with me with plenty of evidence, and I used a lot of it. It's a fantastic opportunity with really amazing people. Uh, the archivist, the department head, and the digital asset manager um, are all wonderful and it's really a fun working environment. And you learn a lot about the history of the area. I now know more about the history of the university and the history of Norman Mineta than I probably ever imagined I possibly could because I've been focusing on those particular collections. So. What do you need to know? You, I'm trying to think of things. Let's see. Probably one of the best things you need to just keep an open mind. When I first started, when I was, I, I came across this opportunity because I was doing an internship for Ann Ag, and um, by there I met Rebecca Cohn, who was the interim head of the department. Oh, okay. I'll I'll start wrapping up. Sorry. <laughs> I just got the note to wrap up. Okay. Um, challenges. Trying to figure out where everything goes or if it belongs to us at all because sometimes we get things that don't belong to us and we have to find homes for them in other collections and sometimes things might belong in multiple collections and it's trying to decide what the best home for it is across the multiple collections. That's probably one of the bigger challenges that we have is just trying to find the right home for whatever it is we happen to have received. And I'll take some questions, other questions, since we're trying to wrap up. I'm not seeing any in chat. Okay, well, if no one has questions, if you think of any later, my email is on the first slide. Feel free to contact me directly, or if you are interested in working for the archive, uh, you can either contact me and I'll refer you to Diane or contact Diane directly. Uh, we'd love to have you be part of the team. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to give a big thanks to uh, all of our presenters this evening. Um, you were all did a fantastic job, and we really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to thank our wonderful programming team for putting this event together, um, as well as the entire executive committee for, uh, of SLA for uh, all their publishing and for getting the word out and social media. Um, newsletter, everything like that. So um, I want to thank everybody and I want to uh, wish you all a, a great night. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording now.